it's not just your talent and your musicality that you have to work really hard on, but also your people skills are just as important and sometimes more important. Stay straight, be responsible, be a good human being, caer bien, be pleasant. Lewis, this is so great to have you here. Thank you so much on behalf of the sessions. I have seen you perform many times. We've hung out. You always are inspiring and you are as active now as you've ever been in your life, which is amazing. Yeah, thank you, man. Thank it's you my, so much. It's my pleasure to be here, man, really. Where did, where did this all start for you? I mean, where did, where did percussion and music enter your life? Where did this begin? Well, you know, it all starts with my family, you know, even though uh, I'm back in the island of Cuba, where I was born, in Santiago. Mm -hmm. Even though uh, my parents, my father was a doctor, my mom had studied law, and my uncles were doctors, and aunts were like professors and all that, they all play instruments. <laughs> and they love music. And as far as I can remember since I was a kid, it's just music's at home and, and not just music being played, you know, on the radio and things yeah. like that, but people come to the house and playing, <laughs> or my family playing, or my dad making comments about a song that's on the radio. Check out the bass on that song. <laughs> I mean, this kind, this is the kind of people I grew up. So I was a little kid, man. I just started banging on things, playing along to the radio and and the local people that were playing, you know, there's a lot of percussion in, in the streets all out there. The, all the streets, yeah. My dad, there's a picture, I actually, I was gonna bring it, I forgot to bring it, it's that I have, and I was like, uh, probably six or seven years old, and it's Christmas day, and in the picture, I have my toys, and I have a conga drum. Ah. And I'm actually playing the conga drum. My dad took the picture. And the story of that is, when my dad would take me to the park, Parque Cespedes, which is the center of Santiago, oh, and, yeah. Cats would be playing, you know, Roomba in the corner or guys practicing for the carnival, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> I had nothing to do with my little tricycle or my ball or whatever. <laughs> I wouldn't go over there. <laughs> so just before Christmas, not, my dad was a doctor, so everybody knew him in town. Somebody knocked on the door. It was this couple of guys. It says, Dr. Conte, we made this drum for your son because he loves the drum. How beautiful. So that's how that. So you're playing, or you, uh, were you jamming with other musicians? Not jamming at home, just I jammed jamming to home. the radio, and, and I didn't jam out on the streets. Yeah. You know, just being around music, and my parents would have parties, like a anniversary party and birthday, the, the kids' birthday parties turned into like being an adult birthday party <laughs> later on, you know, with, you know, guys like Ibrahim Ferrer and uh, Compay Segundo from Buena Vista Social Club, those guys were from my hometown, friends oh, of my yeah. dad, they'd be at my house. Beautiful. And I'd be like, <clears throat> running around and then I grab a pair of claves <laughs> and play with them, you know. So when did you finally get to America? When, when did you get to LA? I was 14. Uh, there was a speech made by the Comandante Fidel Castro that said that we need the youth of our country in the army. So no one that's a male can leave the island from the age of 15 till whatever it was. And my dad realized that, and I realized that, and, and I talked to my dad and he talked to me about it. We talked about it and, and uh, I said, man, we're going to try to get you out of here, you know, before your military age, which was 15. Right. So he was able, it was really difficult. I was blessed, man. It's like a miracle that I got out, really. I got out legally. No, none of these, I didn't get on a boat or anything like that. Right, right, I right. flew to Spain from Havana. I'm from Santiago, so we went to Havana, Havana to Spain, where some Jesuits, uh, priests, received me and took care of me while I was in Spain for four months to get my visa to come to the United States where there was a third cousin of my dad who's still alive and his name is Luis Conte, still lives in the same house in Hollywood. So I end up in Hollywood from Santiago de Cuba. That's how it happened. So, you know, it, it took about a, all the proceedings to get out of Cuba was like a year, you know. Yeah. To, I, I left three weeks before I was 15. I just, just, just made it. This is a movie. It's a miracle. Yeah. And this really is powerful. <laughs> so you, you were with these Jesuits there. Were you, did you play any music at that time in Spain no. for months? No, I had got that, that period of my life, I was, especially while I was in Spain. I mean, look, when I was, let me say that when I was in Cuba, I was, it wasn't just all Cuban music right. and all rumba. I was into mm -hmm. the Beatles, into rock and roll. I played guitar also, and I took guitar lessons. And I wanted to play, 
Beatles songs. And, and that music was in Cuba at that time? How, it was how, not. How did, yeah, it how was did it get illegal. in? Yeah, it was illegal. It was illegal <laughs> to listen to rock and roll. It was illegal to listen to jazz. Mm. A lot of people don't realize that. Yeah. You know, guys have, uh, wear those t-shirts with Che Guevara, the famous Che Guevara. He hated music. Yeah. And if you were caught listening to rock and roll, you know, you we got written up, you know. So while I was there, for, I got all my papers and I came to L.A., to Hollywood. 6443 La Mirada Avenue, right there. <laughs> like Wilcox and Fountain, right in the middle of it. Of it you know, and which was perfect, because I mean, I love rock and roll, man. Yeah. And I love American music, and I love the Beatles, and all the stuff that was going on, which I couldn't hear. You know, I mean, you know, you could hear some things there. Yeah. But it was all, you know, it's like opening a faucet of water, you know, just like, I got here, it's like, shh, free world, I can hear everything. Music, music, you know. How amazing to experience from oh. the, the, the restrictions you had in Cuba to this unbelievable freedom of expression. Yeah. So now you get settled in, you, are, did, did you gather some percussion products, did you start the process? No, the first thing I did was uh, find a guitar. The home where I went to, it was a lot different than my home, and it, was, it wasn't a very musical home. So music was there, and then you know, people would show up and have, bring a record, or they have a party and they play songs, but my thing at home was like 100%, yeah. this song or that song. You know. So I would play the radio and I listened to stuff, and as soon as I made friends, then I, I got in a little band, but it was a rock band, you know, local kids. You know. And you were playing guitar? I played some guitar, yeah. <laughs> and then, because of some of these songs, you know, has maracas, little congas, you know. Then I said, hey, wait a minute, I can do that, you know. But I, I had no idea of being a musician. I had the farthest from my mind was that I was going to be a musician, even then. <laughs> it's just, you know, you can see that I just came, I just came from Brazil, you know, and places like that. You know, a lot of people play, and it's like, it's just what you do. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like you go to the supermarket or you go to the beach and or we play. Yeah. You know, that's kind of like how I was. It's just something you do. Oh well, yeah, way it's just of life. Right. Yeah. I figured I was going to be a doctor or, or something. I had no idea, but I was going to be something else. <laughs> so know? this band is happening, you're playing. When did it start? When did you put down guitar and start to look more at percussion? It was, I can tell you right now, man, like, so I finished high school. I go to Los Angeles City College. I sign up to get, take some classes of what I still don't know. Because the good Lord knew I was going to be a musician. He had me going, yeah, you still don't know, because you're going you're gonna to find it, man. That's just how it works. <laughs> so I get to this party. I mean, it's like a, you know, a, you know, like a, one of the associations of school, you know, like you, right. you belong to this one club or something. Right. Oh, there's a little hang over there, you know, after school. Oh, let's go over there. So we go to this guy's house, and there's a conga drum. And somebody had a guitar or something like that, and they start playing, and I go like, hey, let me play that for a second. I go, and it felt like, you know, I don't know, it's like when you're like releasing everything, you know, it's just yeah. like, it's, it's like, oh man, I love this. <laughs> and that was it right there, so I, I then I start going, okay, well, how do I, how do you, where'd you get this drum? Where do you get this? Other things happened right at the same time. It was all meant to be, you know, at, at the students' union, I was going to class and I hear congas. I hear, it wasn't incredibly played, you know, being from Cuba, you know, very, I'm very, you know, very aware like, oh, that's of not rumba. It's like, yeah, what, what, what are those guys playing? <laughs> and it was the Af African American Student Association that were having a, a meeting that day or a function, yeah. and they have four or five guys there with that shigis, you know, and, and these beautiful Val J congas, <laughs> you know. And I just went in there, and when they took a break, I just went up there and said, hey man, where'd you get these drones? Where do you get this stuff? Yeah. You know, it's, this is, I'm talking 1970, okay? It's not now, you know, you see all this, everything it's is- everywhere now. Everywhere. Yeah. It was very different 40 it's years ago. It's yeah. hard yeah. to find a gong. yeah, it's yeah. different. Yeah. Yeah. And they go, oh, you know, uh, over in Sunset, Sunset of Michael Torrena, you know, Val J. Congress, man, you know. And the phone number was in the little tag of the thing. <laughs> so, you know, and I, hey, can I play a little bit? And I jammed with them a little bit. You know, it's just, I gotta get some set of drums like this. <laughs> and then that's how I, you know, then I met somebody and another guy and I went to Griffith, I heard that Griffith Park, they had like Roombas happening, which really wasn't just a bunch of thunder drummers playing, yeah. you know, <laughs> but drums. 
drums everywhere. I found a cat at that Griffith Park who he said, I don't remember his name, he said he was a relative of Tito Puente. He was from New York. And he had a cassette of like Willie Colon. Mm. And he played, I said, listen, I've, I'm totally ta detached. I've, it's been three years or so that I'm detached from my whole heritage and, right. and the music and everything. And he goes, uh, I'm gonna forget this, he goes, uh, oh man, this is like in New York, man, these cats are, they played all the stuff in New York. It wasn't called salsa yet. It's just Cuban music, you know. Pre-salsa, Who are these cats, man? Oh, Willie Colon, just, hey, you know, my, my uncle or whatever is Tito Puente. Oh, I didn't know who Tito Puente was. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, okay, that's nice. But where did you find this cassette? He says, oh, well, down on, in, on, there's a store downtown on 3rd and Broadway called Doran Music, <laughs> and you can buy this stuff there. So I, there I went, bought some records, started listening, seeing names, you know, and starting getting into it. Well, it's almost like the path was laid out for you. Yes, sir. All you had to do was walk it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Really, that's what this sounds like. Yeah. So now you're organizing yourself more with percussion. Uh, you know, you're, you're still in school at the time, I guess, right? Yeah, I went from going to full time to you know part time and less classes and yeah. And uh, I did take a couple of music classes of music theory because I, I said, oh man, music. I was gonna be. A, I was taking classes to be an X-ray technician. <laughs> And I took the first semester, and and I took some music classes, and like, I started like not going to. I've just like, <laughs> I got an F on that, man. I just bailed and ended up taking some music three classes and beginning piano, and then I hit the road. So you hit the road now. So w when did this turn into a real professional touring? What was that first that that, that first commitment? Okay, first you had in the question of when did I first start making bread? Yeah, it yeah. was trying to get a gig just out of necessity. I need some money. I'm on my own now. I'm now I'm now I'm 18. Okay, you know I'm not living in my own. My, I'm on my own. I'm living with a couple of cats, you know, in an apartment, you know, yeah, blah blah yeah. blah, you know. And uh, I had a, I had gotten a, so a friend of mine had gotten me a job at the basement of the headquarters of Bank of America downtown L.A. <laughs> it was the mail room. I just had to open up the mail bags and sort out the stuff. And I was making a certain amount of money a week, which wasn't a lot. And then I meet some people, Johnny Cheddar, Chocolate, these, these guys that were local people that I just heard that they were playing at a club and this and that, and they called me to play a gig. And the gig paid $25. <laughs> and I was working four nights a week at this bank, you know, downtown, I was clearing 40 bucks. And I'm making 25 bucks on Friday and Saturday, playing congas. Bring it on. No brainer. So that was kind of like the first kind of a thing, you yeah. know, where, where I started then just playing in clubs, you know, and, and I met, you know, just networking, you know, start meeting all the guys in the, in the yeah, scene, that, that band, that band. That's where the beginning process is. So I mean, networking is, is an interesting concept because what that means is you have to try to connect with as many people as you can to see if you can develop into something more than what you have. Right. So how did you start with the whole networking concept? How did you bring guys into knowing who you were? Just putting two and two together, figuring if I met you and you knew some other guys, you'd be able to tell me about, tell them about me, or so and so and so, you know. Word of mouth. Word of mouth. Right. You know, just who you meet and, hey, this is my number, you know. You know? But as, as simple as it sounds, you have to have good people skills. You have to be able to know how to sell yourself without sounding like you're selling yourself. And you want to create that kind of you know, circle of friends that would want to be associated with you. That's right. That's I, a skill. That, yeah, and I attribute that to my dad, man. My dad was my hero, and, and he just always showed me to... He, he had a thing in, in Spanish. He said, Usted lo que tiene siempre que hacer es caer bien. Caer bien means to fall correctly, to, to just be pleasant. Yeah. All you need to do is be pleasant, be mm. nice. Beautiful. That's all you need to do. He always used to say that. You have to carry me in. Oh, yeah. Just go along life, man. I'm meeting guys and be nice to people and, and do your best at the gig. Don't be late, don't you know, screw up, you know, be responsible. Act like, professional, so. Professional. Was, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, have your stuff. If you, don't, don't lie, don't, yeah. you know, just straight up. But, but you've always been that way as long as I've known. You've always been straight, professional, right. top of the notch. So where to go from there? I mean, all, there's so many different artists that you've played with yeah. and that you continue to play with. Where did it go from that next $25 a night job? How did that, uh, how did that build? This fellow that was playing with this 
in, in this club called Chess Pico, it was down in Pico in Vermont, it's down here, now it's the hood, you know. And uh, I go, I hear that, I didn't know, I didn't know there was a musician's union. <laughs> now I wanna be a musician, so musician's union, I'm thinking, you know, coming from a corporate, sort of like, I'm gonna be a doctor kind of a thing, <laughs> like, oh, I'll go to the union, I'll get a gig, right? Maybe not. <laughs> so I go to the union. Where is the union? Sunset uh, Vine and uh, Melrose. Okay, so I go to the union. Oh man, well, that's my old hood. I grew up in Hollywood, you know. And I run into this cat named Johnny Cheda, who stuttered, <laughs> but he sang, so he would tell you something. And I go, please, can you tell me, can you sing it to me? <laughs> so, so Johnny goes, hey Luis, how you doing, man? I met him, I met him at that club. Speaking of networking, right? Being nice, he goes, there hey man, there was a couple of people here, they're looking for a percussion player. Really? He says, yeah, they said they're going to New York or something. I went, what? Where are they? He says, oh, they left, but here, I got their number. <laughs> Please, pay phone. You call them up. Hello, man. That band was a group called the Hughes Corporation. Mm. The hit song was Rock the Boat. Right. It's a very big hit that yeah. they had. This is like 1972, 73. And you know, I called them. I called, hey, my name is so-and-so. You guys looking for somebody to play? He says, yeah, yeah, where are you? Come down, we're playing right now. And they were, so I got my drums. I had, I had already bought a set of Val J. Okay, us, nice. And I had a tambourine and a cabasa and a shaker, you know. I headed down there and, and I just sat down. And, I didn't know I was auditioning. I, didn't, I had no idea how things worked. I just <laughs> went down and played. <laughs> It goes, oh, okay, hey, great. You know, we go next week. We're we're doing a promotional. We have a song that's kind of climbing up in the charts, and we're on RCA Records. We're going to Cherry Hill, New Jersey, New York, Philadelphia, and Washington D.C. Going, oh my God, yeah, I'm going. <laughs> I didn't even ask for money. I just like, really, when are we leaving? I love the the honesty and the innocence that you had, <laughs> and that you continue to have. Mm, so that first gig now led to more. Now here you are doing more. Nah, man, look, the first gig that we did, we flew, I mean, as far as like experience, you know, things that, I, that that band did and I got to see, I remember landing, and the first gig was in Newark, New Jersey. And we go straight from the airport, we go to Soundcheck. It's the old days, I had my congas in, the, in, in, in <laughs> fiber cases in the plane, I'm dragging the congas in the suitcase, everybody's like moving, and we go, we go through the backstage, and I hear, do <laughs> what is that? You know, it was the OJs. <laughs> so, long story short, just with those guys, I was with them for about a year. I got to do Midnight Special, Soul Train, Don Kirshner in concert. Biggest shows. ABC in concert. Biggest shows. Playing next to the Spinners, Earth, Wind on Fire, the OJs, you name it. Sly and the Family Stone. Mm -hmm. we, did, we did one leg of a tour in the summer. There was like the Ohio Players, the Staple Singers, Sly and the Family Stones, and the Hughes Corporation. I mean, us four traveling around the South playing gigs. Unbelievable. Yeah. Coming from like, I had no idea what was going on. Now I'm doing all this stuff, you know? So you're doing all these shows, you're doing television. What was on your mind? How could you even comprehend from where you came from in Cuba to what you were doing at that time? And I say it because it got even bigger from there, yeah. <laughs> what you're doing. So. What were you thinking about? I really didn't think much. I mean, I didn't think. You just kept on going. Yeah, I didn't. I mean, I, I keep thinking, God, that hey, this is, this is awesome. Yeah. You know, God, I'm so so blessed that I'm doing this. But it's not like it's just something like. I mean, you're really young. Yeah, at the time, yeah. So it's just like, well, this is what you do. You know, yeah, what's happening? Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. You know. Well, interesting. You have an ability of playing, obviously, you know, Cuban and Latin music, which is which is the core of who you are. But you're fantastic at funk and rock and jazz. I mean, you really have widened the span. Where'd that come from? I love all the music. And I didn't mention being, when I was back in the island, I think besides loving rock and roll, and yeah. I remember my, my sister bringing in an Elvis record, and I wore out um, Bill Haley and the Comets, <laughs> Rock Around the Clock. I wore out that LP, man. And she had a Rick and L. You know, this is impossible to find in Cuba, what I'm saying. Right, okay, right, right. She, I don't know how she had them, where she got them from. And she had this Rick and Nelson record. But my dad had bought a, ra a radio, from a Russian radio. But somewhere, I'm like messing with it. I get this station, and it's a pop, American pop station. I don't know where it was from. I live in the south of... Cuba then, 
So it could have been from Jamaica or from, Absolutely. I don't know. Absolutely, how amazing. So I listen, always listen to all this stuff. In all of the traveling and the recordings that you've done, how do you organize yourself? How do you, how do you put this all together? How do you maintain a schedule of flying? I know you do as, as much flying as I do. We're constantly going. It's hard to even remember where we came from, nevertheless yeah. understand where we're going. Mm -hmm. How do you organize all that? Is your My date book. Now the iPhone, you know, the iCloud thing, you know. I mean, so you have it all easier. electronically. All, yeah. You organize with a calendar. With a calendar, yeah. I keep everything written down. I, everything right. that I have to. Get. Otherwise, you forget it. It's too much I, I going on. I agree. I agree. And I keep all my calendars. I have all my books from ever. Double check, triple check. Make sure I'm not double booking myself. Right, right, right. That's a very right. important thing. Don't double book yourself. Mm, well said. There's a certain fear that I know I have with exactly that reason, which is why my skills got to a higher level. It was fear of being able to make a mistake like that. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's horrible. I've done it, I mean, it's happened. Is there a gig that you can just think of? I'm gonna put you on the spot a Is there a gig you can think about that stands out that, that was just, I can't believe I'm doing this with this artist? Is there anything that jumps out? Rehearsing with James Taylor for the first time. Right. You know, I, I'm like, here I am. Still my, you know, my parents ended up coming from Cuba once I was 22 years old. So here I am in LA, 19 years old, on my own, and I listen to You Got a Friend, and now I'm like a grown man, a professional musician, and I'm sitting in this, in SIR New York, and it's the first time I hear the voice live, you know, I'm rehearsing, and he opens his mouth, and we're doing You Got a Friend. <laughs> you heard of the band Ira Kere? Yes. Yes. With the famous great Chucho Valdez, Paquito yes. Rivera, Arturo Sandoval. Yeah, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. You know, amazing Cuban jazz band. I mean, I idolized these guys. I had never seen them because they weren't, they didn't exist when I was a kid there. Right. It happened again from this side because of the embargo. Before that, I was in Cuba trying to listen to rock and roll and I couldn't do it. And then I'm over here and I'm trying to listen to what's happening in Cuba and I and couldn't do it. You can't do that. Interesting. <laughs> so we got cassettes and this, I remember, I knew all the music of Iraquere, you know. This is before all this opening and all this stuff. This is quite a while, in the 80s, I think it was. And I get a call from someone, this, this guy, Juan Morillo, who says, hey man, Iraquere is, some of the guys from Iraquere are coming to do this thing at UCLA. It's, and then they're gonna play a couple of gigs. But they didn't let some of the guys out. <laughs> so they have no conga player. Would you wanna come down and play conga? <laughs> with them at this, it's kind of a clinic that they did. Yeah. Are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, it's not that playing in two, for 200,000 people, you know, in a big stadium that really rocked my, my world. I mean, it's like, I'm gonna play with those guys? <laughs> I'll be there. So literally that day, I was doing a session with Cheryl Crow. And it's one with Hugh Pageant and then, you know, and it's getting later and later. And I'm supposed to be at UCLA at seven o'clock. And it's like, and finally I just went, guys, I gotta go. <laughs> we gotta continue tomorrow. I, I really gotta be somewhere at seven o'clock. I'm sorry. Okay, okay. Traffic. I'm sweating. I don't forget to get to UCLA Park. I walk in and it's just a couple of minutes before they're gonna go on. And I walk in and it's I'm behind. They're standing behind the curtain. It's Chucho Valdez, Carlos Del Puerto Senior. Legends. Carlos Emilio Morales, the guitar player. Uh, Paquito and Arturo weren't there anymore, but. Other home, the other home players. And I walk in like a groupie, man. I go like, Chucho, man, man, Luis Golden, hey man, I'm like your biggest fan, man. I've heard everything, I know, I mean. And they were like standing at me like, it was like, great, man, nice meeting you, man. And, and Chucho says, we thought you were older. <laughs> I go, man, I'm just thrilled to play with you guys. So he says, listen, we're gonna play this song and that song and that song. So just keep an eye on me, you know, when there's some, I, you know, I'll give you a cue, you know, just, you know, so I don't blow the break. Right, know. right. I'm going, sure, I know all the tunes. I didn't tell him that, I said, okay. So we played this first song, which I forget what it was. And at the very end, there's this lick. He gives me the cue, and I'm, whatever, right? <laughs> People, ah, Chucho stands up and says, points at me and goes, hey. <laughs> Everything else, all that stuff that you were telling me about, is true. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of my highlights. You were prepared. That's yeah. the key thing. You were prepared. It sounds like at every, at every performance, you did the, you know, the hard work to prepare yourself 
for that gig. Yeah, not knowing that I was ever gonna get, but Absolutely. just, you know. You know, Cachao is another thing, yeah, a great yeah. bass player. While I was here before, you know, when I was in Los Angeles City College, I had made friends with a really close friend uh, from Santiago, actually, that, that was here in LA. There weren't too many people from Santiago, most people are from Havana. Right, right. And we hit it off real good. And I, would, I was on my own, so I would go to his mom's house and eat, you know, she'd <laughs> cook for me and all this stuff. And he had the famous Descarga, the Cachao albums. Have you ever heard of these yes, records? Yes, I have heard you of them. Know, Absolutely. That's the encyclopedia. Yeah, that's that's the serious of stuff. Of Cuban licks, yeah, man. Absolutely. Tata Wine, Guillermo Barreto on Timbales, you know, El Yeyo in Bongo, Cachao, Cachao's brother, Orestes in piano, El Nero Vivar. Anyway, I memorized this thing. Yeah. I could sing to you every lick. And, you know, later on in life, I start working, going to Las Vegas with the Supremes. And Walfredo Reyes Sr., who's one of my mentors, yeah. he's like my brother, my... Beautiful man. Yeah. yeah, Sr., he's there. I meet Wally Jr., who was <laughs> in high school, and uh, I start going, and he says, hey, you know, Cachao is here in Vegas, you know? Cachao lives in Vegas? Yeah. <laughs> yeah he plays at Club Prasas Barge at the lounge with uh, Poopy Campos, you know, Cuban band. And... Really? <laughs> so I start hanging out over there, and then we start having jam sessions in the afternoons at Walfredo's house. Unbelievable. And Walfredo Sr. was in Vegas with Wayne Newton at the time. Right. So, I mean, to see the fact that all these musicians now are connecting and what they have, unbelievable. All these names that you're mentioning, what's important for the viewers of this is for them to hear these names that you're mentioning and do the research. Yes. Find out who they were, find out their music, do the research, because these are powerful names that were not only a part of your life, but a part of fundamental history of the core of music. That's right. This is what they have to hear. In closing, if I asked you to say something to the next generation, you know, young musicians watching this here, and no matter what instrument they play, they're watching this, they're hearing your voice, they're hearing the, the spirit and the passion as you speak. What would you pass on to them that could give them some kind of hope or direction for their future? Well, you know, realize that you're blessed with the talent, you know, mm -hmm. and then keep your eyes on the prize and stay, look at the light. There's a light at the end of the tunnel over there, yeah. and it's hard to get over there. It's not gonna be easy, yeah. but and there's bumps and steps and all kinds of stuff that's gonna happen. You just gotta keep it, keep your eye there, work on your craft, stay straight, be respond, be a good human being, caer bien, be pleasant. Yeah, you're gonna be on the road, maybe with some guys. You gotta get along with yeah. people. You know, it's not just your talent and your musicality that you have to work really hard on, and your your skill but also your people skills are just as important, and sometimes more important. Right. Because you could have a great, great player here, man, and they may call this guy that's not a, maybe not as good. They'd be pretty good, but not as good as this other incredible guy, but his people skills are, people want to be around the guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. it's simple, you know. But just straight ahead. Stay straight. <laughs> that is powerful words. You have always been straight. You've always been honest. You always have had great levels of deep passion in everything you have done. We wish you great, great success. Keep it going. Thank you so much for your time, Luis. I love you so much. Thank you on my behalf brother. of the sessions. Oh, man. <laughs> it's my pleasure, man. <laughs> great, my pleasure. great job.